there's a friendly rivalry here, and I, I do apologize, <laughs> but it does exist. Um, so, we any questions from the audience? I'm happy to start with a question. Um, and I'd, I'd really like to push Michael a little more on, on the fact that uh, you find the socioeconomic inequalities with respect to the use of data. Can it be fixed? I mean, do you, you gave an example where it seemed like maybe it was, but is it just such a hard problem that maybe we can't fix it? Well, I liked Eric's, uh, I, I, will, I will quote Eric's example again. I mean, I think that by paying attention to, um, to how the data can be used, uh, through training and through working, working with those who can have those kinds of applications. I mean, I, it's, it's not going to fix it, but I think it will go some some way to democratizing the use of the of the data. I think that's, uh, and I, I think that it's um, it's something that, as I say, I mean, attention has to be paid because if attention isn't paid, then it will be completely forgotten, and, and it, you know, it will it will be a steamroller, uh, which will further inequality. Because I think actually quite directly further this inequality. Certainly worry that I have, yes, as well. And Megan, you talked some about the cultural work that's involved in creating good data. And one of the things that many of us know who have created data sets is the degree to which uh, the data are often very imperfect and that we wish a lot more effort had been put into improving the quality of those data. But often the problem is, is they're administrative data. They were, uh, they were created for a certain purpose and the items for which they were created are pretty good, but anything else is really pretty lousy. So what can we do about that problem? Uh, um, I mean, I think certainly data standards is one thing that gets talked about a lot. Um, uh, having great metadata that describes how the data was collected um, is, is another way of thinking about it. I actually think um, in certainly some of the scientific disciplines, there's starting to be pretty sophisticated mechanisms for sharing data sets across um, different experiments and and they're thinking really hard about how you talk about you know how the data was collected and when it makes sense to sort of do um, meta surveys using multiple data sets so I think there might be some lessons to to draw from the science community in that one but I think certainly um, coming up with standards and talking about having sort of a baseline that people can talk about when they're um, then they're moving away from uh, getting people to use them is, an, is a whole other issue. I've done a lot of work in the humanitarian um, information making space, and you know there's something like sphere standards, which will say like your latrine has to be X number of feet away from you know a refugee camp, um, or like your water source and your latrine have to be so far away from each other. Um, but actually getting people on the ground to to use that and even to talk about it in the data sets that they're creating is a totally different story. So, uh, yeah. It's a, it's a tough problem. It's a tough problem. So, Jonathan, somebody asked, can you speak more about how you're opening up geospatial data, what and how, and, and, I, and I think one of the issues here is the privacy issues, because obviously if you have it really down to the household level or something like that, it, privacy is gone. Yeah, yeah. I, privacy is gone. <laughs> oh, that's true. Um, <laughs> is, is that a statement just... Privacy's gone, forget about it, the old... The train has left the station. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. We ain't going back. Um, and that's just the nature of the future. Uh, so with uh, Palo Alto collects, like many cities, an enormous amount of geospatial information. It's, it's very much the, the sort of underlying uh, fabric of, of any community. And uh, it's, it's, been, it's been in a proprietary system. And you can, of course, request the information. Um, we're obligated to, to provide it. But we want people to have it available to them so they can use it, they can manipulate it in any way they see fit. Uh, the technology we adopted is uh, Google Fusion Tables. It's a, it's a free uh, technology. It integrates with Google Maps, the Google Maps Engine. And um, it, it, we give sort of templates of data. For example, trees is one of them. Um, other types of um, uh, layers uh, within the city. I think there's about 10 today. Um, and, and then all the data is exportable in, in, in a series of formats. Um, the question of how do we protect some of it, and by the way, because we are a full utility city, um, that is Department of Homeland Security protected type data, um, we do have a process, a vetting process. So from the point at which we determine we're going to, um, we'd like to release the information to the point at which it is released, it goes through a series of gates, including the city attorney, our emergency services director, um, and um, we do obviously we look for to make sure the data, uh, the integrity of the data is uh, there. 
um, and then we, we, we release it. So this is sort of a related question because I think there you've got the question of what's going to uh, predominate, the question of the Homeland Security issues or the need for transparency. And so David, talking about your data, where it seems to me you really have attention mm -hmm. there, because I'm not con completely convinced, I don't want to say I don't care about the privacy of some of these inmates, but I really think they're there, they, they're there for a reason, and that maybe they should have less in the way of confidentiality and privacy than other people, partly because we've got to protect them from themselves and from each other. No, and they do. I mean, like, there's, there are exceptions to laws mm -hmm. when someone comes into uh, a prisoner in jail, there's a kind of a, an exception in the HIPAA, like if you're going to continue to provide treatment from them, then your provider can give you emergency information. So while it's a risk, they, they do kind of operate with this lower expectation of privacy. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if they're coming back in the, the, into the community, at that point, all that goes away and they have the same protection right. of privacy rights as everyone else. Um, something that we do when we're doing... So part of your problem is time limiting it in some Time way. limiting is part of it. And then, you know, if we're doing kind of like an assessment of the way an agency is operating, um, just to make sure, I mean, this is pretty standard practice, but we've developed encryption methods. So, you know, if we get data on a population, if we're doing population level analysis, we make sure that we've de-identified um, everyone's personal information. Um, and I, I think, you know, it just depends on what you're trying to achieve how far you have to go to, to worry about privacy in this context. Yeah. So this one, I think, is a really fundamental one, too. Connecting Megan's historical analysis with Michael's, does current and future technology cause major change in how data uh, are... I've got to get the right pair of glasses on here. Uh, in how uh, data uh, workflow and use affects equity access, or is it more of the same? I think the question here is, is are we getting to a place where we can actually have better solutions to these problems than we've had in the past, partly through technology? Or are we just really in the same situation as we were in the past? And furthermore, will those solutions to those problems mean that we just have a replication of the past? So this is for Michael or Megan. Since Go ahead. <laughs> uh, um, so, so, okay, so technology and change. So I think... Um, one thing I tend to, to want to advocate is um, rather than thinking about technology and change um, simply as you know, a set of devices or, or even um, technical infrastructures, that we think more um, about sort of practices uh, around how, how we do this work. Um, so rather than say like, uh, I don't know, you know, is technology going to change X or is it going to change Y if we can say, um, what are our practices of using data? How do marginalized communities in the U.S. use data to advocate for X, Y, Z? Um, you know, or it, so rather than saying like, does it matter whether it's on paper or whether it's on um, on a computer? I think maybe focusing more on saying sort of how can we change these practices um, might be might be a, a better approach for thinking about issues around equity and access and getting away from the conversation strictly about technology. I don't know if that answers it. No, but. Just Michael? Uh, I agree. I mean, it's, uh, I, I think these are social issues and not technology issues, although <laughs> there are technology elements to it in terms of the, the way in which the data is presented, for example, or the kind of data that's presented, or the, the, um, uh, the context into which the kind of technology context in which the data is presented. If, you're, if you are using a uh, uh, presentation software that's expensive, for example, or requires you know, very significant amounts of skill to master, uh, then that's going to be exclusive immediately. And, and, so those, and those are very often decisions that are made unconsciously and, and, uh, uh, and could be changed uh, if there was a recognition that the, that the outcome is going to be an issue. So. So, historically, journalists often played the role of the people who would gather information and put it together in a way that people would understand. Uh, now we're talking about making a lot of data transparent, but the concerns that this panel has, has put forth is that you know, not everybody can just understand raw data, so we've got to have somebody who's processing. Who's that going to be? It's not going to be the news media, I don't think, given what's happened to the news media in America. So you've got the 10% rule, the 10%, but where would that 10% even go? What kind of institutions are you thinking about? 
Maybe Megan's got an answer. You said. No, I mean, I think that's a huge question. Is this question of like the political economy of data. And I sort of had that called out on a slide as like things I'm not going to get to talk about. But like who's paying for making the data? Who's paying for, I mean, all of these nonprofits are doing amazing work processing the data and bringing it to the communities and bringing it to the media. But like, you know, I'm, you know I don't know of any nonprofit that's like, yeah, we're flush with cash and uh, we could <laughs> right. definitely take on more work. So it's like that's... It's a real problem of who's who's paying for this and 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 um, yeah and then who gets to profit? I mean I think another sort of weird conversation that we didn't have uh, earlier that we might have could have maybe could have is who gets to profit from the derivatives of these open data? So people develop algorithms around them, um, they profit from those algorithms. Um, you know, does that profit go back into making the data and making the data open and available? And, and so I think that's a bigger conversation. Michael, anything to add? Uh, just that I think there's a, uh, a, a, a set of intermediary organizations and individuals that, that are necessary. Now, how they're paid for is another question, but, they're, but they're, th that there is that kind of uh, uh, translator, that kind of translation process is, I think, absolutely essential. Yeah, the civil society really, really matters. Civil society yeah. its role for that, yeah. Well, this question actually is another way of getting at this question. What are the key skills or areas of expertise that future civic leaders need to know to use data for better governance? And I think when we talk about civic leaders here, I think we don't want to just mean mayors and council members. We want to talk people of nonprofit organizations and so forth. So that's something we've got to do too, is somehow train people to understand how to use data. How are we going to do that? I mean, that's a, that's a training is a complicated question, but I mean, that just implies that people are going to come with a set of skills to understand the technology and produce data in a form that they're able to, to use it. Um, you know, I would like to see people come, you know, to a public health agency with the ability to um, pull administrative data, to create data, data sets that can actually be used for kind of interagency collaboration. Um, <coughs> Or for diagnosing a problem. Who had the asthma right. example? That was a great example. Was that yours, Michael? Yeah, yeah, that was a fantastic example. Yeah. But, uh, uh, what was interesting about it was that um, it, there was specific training. I mean, they, they not only did they do the study, but they actually had training programs to which you know, uh, a community activist, a community organizer, could go and be trained. Uh, presumably, he wasn't, you know, he or she wasn't a, a data specialist, but they were trained sufficiently that they could actually reanalyze the data and make use. Figure of it. out what's the truck yeah. stop that was doing. And, that, and that's the ten percent. I mean, that's where the ten percent yeah, yeah, comes. Yeah, no, exactly. I lost my thought, but um, it made me think of Eric Cordera's presentation. Yeah, if you had that type of like platform that you could trade, so to come in there with the raw data, plug it in, and get you know like the health stuff, get a geographic kind right. of outlook at health needs. So Jonathan, how are you facing the issue of standards, enforcement, and, and, and I, here's the one that really intrigues me, resistance from departments at the city of Palo Alto. Megan said, I think it was Megan who said, the trouble with data is that it's often, it's my data, you know, they're, they're my, mm -hmm. my stuff and nobody else is going to get it. I've faced this again and again when I've tried to get data from the state of California, for example. So how are you dealing mm -hmm. with that? Sure. And if I, I just want to add a little comment just to the last discussion. Um, I, I, first of all, I think we're all technologists now. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and I think that uh, both computer programming and data are new literacies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, at some level, uh, we're all programming something, uh, whether it's uh, our Netflix or um, where we use social media. Uh, and I think increasingly people will be able to create apps and solutions just as a core competency. Um, so just as a, a side comment. Um, with regard to, uh, you know, <laughs> experiencing any resistance with city leaders, uh, in some ways, I don't think Palo Alto is necessarily characteristic um, of a lot of communities and, and leaders um, because we generally do get a, 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 a fairly a seamless um, cooperation in terms of, of, of releasing data. Uh, I spent a good really? deal. Really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sort of yeah. stunned, yeah. yeah. And so there's no department that is saying, I won't give you the data because they're either afraid of what it will show or they just feel like it's something they have as a bargaining chip. That's right. If, if it's not... Uh, re regulatory, legal, pr legally protected. If it's, okay. uh, but they're not. I mean, but often agencies hide behind that. They'll mm -hmm. tell you all sorts of things about how sure. I can't give you the data because there's all these regulations about it. And then you find out, no, that's not really true. Sure, sure. I haven't experienced that. No, and, and okay. I will say that um, part of it was those that are thinking about releasing it for the community. Um, the first day that you start to talk about open data shouldn't shouldn't be about technology. Um, so I told it in sort of a storytelling format starting with, um, you know, here's an interesting thought, 
And it was a series of weeks and months before I got to the point in which, you know, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to use our, our platform, our, um, a shout out to our platform uh, CEO right here, uh, Diego May. Um, that was later in the process. So it was about um, getting buy-in based on the, um, uh, the responsibility, I think, that governments have first, and then later on the additional value of the derivative solutions and things like that that, that emerge. Um, I think there was a point about standards or something in your question. But, uh, yeah, no, there was also a question about uh, how are you facing the issue of standards, which gets at this issue of trying to make sure that people aren't using standards as an excuse for not giving you data, mm -hmm. yeah. that you have standards that make sense. Well, so if I could just say one last point. Well, there is no standards among government data. We're trying to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're right at the beginning. But the, the, uh, I, I, I do see that we're still a minority of cities that are doing open data. But there's no question about that. Um, and um, the, the argument, strong arguments need to be made to city leaders that the benefits of open data completely outweigh the negative. Um, the, the resistance can often be legitimate, but the benefits will outweigh that. And that's a very important uh, dialogue to have. Great. Thank you. Yeah, so the, I've got two questions on privacy here, uh, which is, which really sort of amount to um, how do you make it good so that we can actually protect people, but on the other hand, how can we make it open enough that we can get things done? So one person notes that in Scandinavia, because there's openness of tax return data, people can do all sorts of simulations and policy analyses to try to find out what the impact would be of various policies. Uh, here it's really hard to get tax return data. I once got it from the state, uh, and I went to a building where they said I could get it, and it was completely unmarked in Sacramento. Uh, the uh, uh, franchise uh, uh, tax board. Uh, so they, and that was because they just didn't want anybody to know they were there. So, and they didn't want their data used either. So, what do we do? What are good things we can do to help protect people's privacy? And to what extent are those things maybe, however, impeding really being able to use data in ways that would be useful? Um, I mean, in my context, again, I, part of our mission is to empower the person to make them feel like they're stewards of the data, too. So if we're going to be sharing either at the population level or the individual level, sharing sensitive health information, um, I think it, th there has to be some part built into that process where you communicate that that person is still the owner of their data. We want them to, I mean, that's the ultimate goal, right, is for them to engage in healthcare services. So, I mean, we're still thinking about, you know, different technologies and different ways that you can kind of help data follow people as they move through And do you think by trying to get people to feel empowered that that actually makes it more likely that they'll provide their data in I do, yeah, circumstances? I think in some circumstances it does, yeah. Um, Everybody agree with that? I want to add a different point about okay. privacy. Uh, <clears throat> I do a lot, a lot of work with uh, uh, indigenous people and Canadian First Nations and they have very specific issues around, pri uh, around privacy in the sense that they want to retain the control of the, their information in their communities. And they're very reluctant for a whole variety of reasons to uh, allow outsiders to control that information, partly for historical reasons, but also um, uh, a lot of it, some of it has to do with intellectual property and that, that their culture uh, the, the, the indigenous knowledge that they have is something that they want to retain and also it may be related to specific uh, cultural practices that, that are based in the, uh, in the culture itself. There are uh, indigenous people in Australia who have different, language, different languages and different cultural elements that go with um, your age, your age relevance and your, your gender. So, uh, they want to control whatever information comes out because they want to make sure that the information for women only stays with women, the information for men only stays with for men, for example. So there's a whole series of issues there which in some sense are, uh, are a challenge to some of the open data. So what kind of data would these be? I mean, these health data? Or? Uh, they mostly have to do with cultural practices, but some of them may have to do with. So I mean, they may it may have to do with, say, uh, um, uh, local health information because health health information or traditional practices with respect to health may have to do with uh, 
maybe associated with with uh, with one of the genders, for example, mm -hmm. and not with the other. And so that the trans the use of the information by men, if it's women's information, will contaminate that information and make it uh, make it. Uh, uh, not appro not useful in other ways. That, these are cultural practices, and wow. so, so the issue the issue of privacy there is very closely associated with very specific cultural practices and the retention of, of cultural autonomy in, in many 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 contexts. So, Jonathan, do you want to say anything about? You told us earlier that privacy was over. So, why are we so worried about it? Should we continue to be so worried about it, or is uh, this just a rear guard action on the part of people like David? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a kind of, I, clearly I made a flippant comment. Um, uh, the, things like uh, health data is, is clearly protected in the law and things like that. Uh, generally, I think why we're struggling with it is because we're transitioning from um, one era into a new era. Um, there'll be future generations that won't grapple with it the way we're grappling with it. Um, I think there's enormous utility to giving away personal information. Um, whilst we don't, if you ask a um, uh, when people are asked, do they, you know, treasure their privacy? Often they'll say yes, but um, when they go to um, a website where providing information about yourself results in better, uh, a better experience, they'll give away a lot, a lot of information. So the, our aspirations are very different from our actions in, in, in that regard. Um, so I think it's just generational. I think I, I just think that um, the. A society that uh, effectively is riding on information and data um, by default uh, can't protect privacy. It uh, just can't work. So here's my last question, because we're almost out of time, which is what are your, in your uh, belief, the most important research questions? Could each person sort of do a 10 or 15 second or 20 second best, most important research question you'd like to answer if you had a big grant? Anybody? I'll start. Uh, uh, what are the elements of, of uh, uh, providing opportunities for what I call effective use at the, at the grassroots level? Uh, how, do you, how do you ensure that uh, information uh, data can be used at the grassroots level, and what are the most appropriate practices? What models work? What models yeah, work? No, that's a great question. Yeah. I would probably revisit um, national health surveys um, that are primarily household-based and think about ways to restructure them so that they incorporate other populations that are kind of under the radar, just so we have better, clear social facts about people's needs and how to distribute resources. And it's not just people in prisons, as you no, know. It's people no. in assisted living places Absolutely. and all sorts of group homes <laughs> and things like that. So Definitely. I don't know what the total is, but my guess is 10 million or something right. like that you might be missing. Uh, if you don't have them in your surveys, and 10 million is a you know, fairly sizable number of folks. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think I uh, look to a topic that's come up a lot today, which is um, how to make data part of um, active citizenship and sort of a, another form of participation um, in, in sort of everyday practice of being a member of whatever community you're considered a member of, so thinking about how that be, change can happen. It would be nice if civics education wasn't as yes. dull and boring as it is in America. Yeah. You might be able to make it exciting if you actually presented them with some data and to an analyze. And then Jonathan, last word. Uh, goodness, great. Uh, so not a great one, but uh, you know, being very practical for a second. You know, uh, work on um, experimental prototyping around better ways for non-technical people, people to be able to query and, and, and view um, these incredible data sets that are now available. No, I, I think that's actually quite important. Yeah. I mean, I do think there are some technical solutions to some of these problems if we could just figure out exactly what they are and so forth. So thank you. It's been a great panel. Everybody stayed in their time. We had a great discussion. Thank you.